It's not funny. A person died. Get it together. Get a grip. Hi eaters, happy Friday. This is Last Meals. It's where myself, homegirl who has no other skills, I sit down and I eat somebody's last meal. Why are they eating their last meal? Usually because they have done a bad deed which landed them in prison. And on a death row. Sometimes they cheat, sometimes they're not really on death row. This person definitely was. And today we are going all the way to Malaysia. For the bizarre case that is the one of Mona Fendi. How, how have you, I, I blame it on all of you. How have I not heard about this case until now? I need to blame it on somebody else because this is golden. This case is golden. It's one of those short ones, but it has everything. It has all the elements. Also, I know one Malaysian person, so I DM'd her being like, Hey, if I was to tell you the name of Mona Fendi, would you know who this person was? And she's like, duh. Like, everybody does. This is like a normal person, okay? They're not even into true crime. I was shook, meaning the story must be told. So let's begin. Let's dive straight in. I will go and fetch their last meal once it comes to that part of the video, so it's not the empty tray today. I think it's getting filled. You're getting filled today. You're getting filled. It's a weird day. First red flag you could say was that Mona was not her real name to begin with. It was actually her stage name. She was born as Mazna Ismail on the 1st of January 1956 in Kangari, Malaysia. And since the early childhood, she was really into singing, into performing, so that's what she has done. There's not much information on her childhood. That is up until she married Mohammed Afandi. And she was already a small star at that point, so Mohammed's approach was to represent himself as her biggest fan, which seemed to have worked even to the point that Mazna at that time adopted Mohammed's last name Afandi and merged it to her own, with Mona Afandi now being her stage name. So Mohammed asks her for her hand in marriage and he also promises to fund her career. So just to clarify, he is her fan and he is the one supporting her career. So he's the fan and he's the richer one in this case. The logic? Very Ted. Do you see it? I don't. Putting that aside, she manages to release an album called Diana, alluding to the British princess Diana, yes? This was a self-funded album and it didn't really propel her to stardom, but she did have a couple of television appearances due to that. But a couple of years into her career, she realized this is not bringing as much money as she would like, so she switches gears a bit and she changes her career to witchcraft. For the rest of the video to make sense, I need to explain a bit about witchcraft in Malaysia. So Malaysia is mostly a Muslim country and such witchcraft and black magic and all of that is obviously against the religion, it's against the Quran. So people who believed in these powers would go to this group of underworld people that were called bomos or witch doctors. So these are the people that will promise you anything, they can make anything happen to you if you pay the right amount, they can propel your career, they can cure your disease, they can make somebody fall in love with you. And not all Womos were bad or a scam either. There is white magic and then there is the black magic where people just want to scam you out of your money. So they don't actually have any powers whatsoever. Guess which group Mona and her husband belong to. Mona in particular took the lead here and she would excel for a particular reason. She immediately aimed at upper class society. But obviously, as you know, if you have ever switched careers or if you're just starting a new career, you have to prove yourself. And the quickest way she thought she should prove herself is to convince everybody that she has helped the ruling party win the elections, the previous elections, by providing them by different charms and talismans. So when the member of the ruling party that was called United Malays National Organization Party, this state assemblyman, sort of the guy who wanted to propel his career as well, heard about this, heard about Mona's powers, he was intrigued. At the time when the state assemblyman Maslan Idris and Mona Fanley and Mohammed Afandi's paths crossed, Mona has already managed to scam plenty of politicians by promising them this, that their party is gonna win, look at how successful it has worked out for this ruling party. So she was living the high life already. She already had a mansion and multiple luxurious cars. 
So Mazla didn't see through this scam and he approached a couple in Pahan in 1993. Maslan was gunning for the chief minister position, so Mona said, listen, no worries whatsoever. I'm gonna prepare this talisman for you, and this is not just any talisman. This belonged to previous Indonesian president, and this talisman is going to make you invincible. Whatever that meant. They never clarified. <laughs> it never goes into detail But what invincible in this particular situation is. So Mona set the plan in action and she said like he needs to submit a down payment of 500,000 ringgits, which is Malaysian currency, which is equivalent of almost $100,000 today. But that's not all, of course, that's just a down payment. For him to become truly, fully invincible, she is charging 2.5 million ringgits, which is around $1 million or 800,000 pounds. So Maslan takes out this money, sends it to Mona, and also he had to send not just that as a down payment, but also 10 land titles to her, so there was a promise that he is going to own up and pay everything. Shortly after she received the money, her and Mohammed arranged for Maslan to come and visit them in their home in Raub in Pahang for this cleansing ritual. So this is just like a first step in him becoming invincible, this is what's called a flower bath. Maslan comes to the location and they set him up in this room, they lie him down on the floor on his back, and to even try to pretend like this is an actual ritual, she places some flowers all the way around him, tells him to calm down, close his eyes, and wait for the money to fall down the sky. And there are three people present for this ritual, Mona, Mohammed, and their assistant, Jeremy Hassan. Then I have to warn you, this is graphic, I wish somebody warned me that there was a twist to this plot. I don't know what I was expecting, I knew I was going into the true crime case, I was not expecting this, okay? Breathe in, it's gore. Instead of money, falling off the sky, onto Maslan, an X fell. Obviously, axes don't just fall off the sky by themselves, so Jeremy, the assistant, chopped his head off with an axe. Did you expect that? Because I did not. I, I was shook. I was shook at the whole week. I still am. This isn't where the ritual ends, though. If you thought this is very tense, no, it gets worse. They proceed, all three of them now, to cut up Maslan's body into 18 parts as proportionate as they could be, and then to put those parts into the storeroom in their place. And the speculation will say that later, once they locate these body parts, that they couldn't find all of him. They could not find all 18 parts. Speculation says that maybe the trio has eaten some of it. On a very childish note, if you were in, in your wildest dreams, criminal dreams, this is hypothetical, to turn into a cannibal. How do you choose which body parts do you eat? Do you already know which body parts are most nutritious? Cool, I'll, I'll, I'll escort myself out of that hypothetical situation. Let's continue with the story. <laughs> After the murder, Mona and Mohammed just continued their life. Mona really, I feel she was A, in La La Land at this point, but B, that she knew her time was running out. That she knew because Mazan was a political figure, somebody is bound to report him missing and he will be found soon. So remember that down payment that he paid? She went out, she bought a new car, she bought a new Mercedes, she has bought herself a facelift and she also went on a shopping spree, of course. She knew she wasn't getting the rest of that money now because she's a scam and she has killed the person that paid her for her services. And on 2nd of July, the police receives a missing persons report that Muslim has missed out on a couple of political party meetings and also his family hasn't heard of him either. So they start looking into this. The police, they immediately look for the out of the ordinary things. So they see that there was this huge withdrawal of money that was completely out of character for Muslim. Also, he didn't match his lifestyle, like, he didn't withdraw that money for himself, there was no purchase or, like, receipt as to what that money is going towards. And because of this, the police actually reached a dead end. This is all a couple of days after this murder. The police is already bummed out because they can't figure out where this money went to. 
And the trail already, even though this is still July that same year, was going cold. Luckily for Maslan's family and unfortunately for Mona, their assistant, Jeremy, was caught by the police and arrested and brought into the interrogation room on a completely different charge. This guy was brought in for possession of drugs. And while the police is interrogating him completely off topic, he just goes in and says, well, guess what? Actually, I participated in a murder where I cut somebody's head off and we then chopped him into 18 pieces, that particular part. And I know where the body is. So it's somebody I heard you, you've been looking for. And the police is like, what the fuck? The police is like, okay, we're gonna bring you to the scene. At that point, obviously, Jeremy let them in. Mona and Afandi, I don't think from all the reports that I have seen, haven't even been there. They're probably doing their shopping spree. They're living their freaking best life in one of their mansions. While Jeremy is leading the police all the way to the storeroom. And this truly, had this guy not spoken, there's no way that they would be even able to connect this, because it's not even in the storeroom that the body was buried, it was underneath it. So he has dug about a two meters deep of a hole where they put most of their victim's body. As if that wasn't enough, the weapon, the axe, the knives, like everything that they had used to murder Maslan and to then cut off his body was on the premise, was just around the house. And they also found where the body was buried underneath the storage room uh, a pistol that the politician Maslan had on himself that day, just as a final identifier to the body that they have found underneath. The part that any Malaysian will probably remember is the part from now on, which is the trial, because it's truly one of the creepiest things. Mona acted like a lunatic. All of the pictures that you see of her, like going into court, walking by anywhere, even when it's obvious that the camera is not really like focusing on her, she doesn't even see it. She is smiling. She is smirking in every single picture. She would also wear these flashy outfits constantly would remark at times, looks like I have many fans. During the trial, she also would kind of try to intimidate the seven-member jury. So the juries at that time were seven members and then there was a judge presiding. She attempted that thing that you attempt in customer service and you try to enforce authority and you're like, can I speak to the manager because you are not giving me whatever the hell I wanted. So she would kind of name and point to different members of the jury being like, you, you and you, yeah, I'm holding you accountable. They'll be like, uh huh, sure, of course, Mona. She even had a moment where she uh, requested from a judge if she could just sing. Her soul and heart wanted to sing at that very moment, and the judge said that would be really unnecessary. <laughs> I love the judge in this case, just love it. Think you gotta, you gotta love it. The trial lasted for 65 days, and they have heard from more than 75 witnesses, including both Mona and Mohammed, but also including Juraimi. And Jeremy's statement was one of the creepier ones. Quote, I chopped his neck three times to separate the head from the body. I also cut Muslin's body into pieces before burying his remains. End quote. I know it truly just describes the crime, but it's so matter-of-fact. So for 65 days, Mona has taunted the judge, the jurors, but especially the press. She thanked her fans. She would give interviews to anybody asking, even though, you know, it was controlled and she was just passing by. She would say that she is happy and that she is thanking all the Malaysians. For what? For being a fan of her, finally? Because truly, that is what she has finally achieved. Notoriety, something that she wanted from the early age and couldn't achieve the legal, normal way. So after two and a half months, the jury only took less than 70 minutes around an hour, to reach the guilty verdict. And at the time, this offense carried a death penalty by hanging. Once they read the verdict, Mona again thanked everybody for their time, for their decision. She thanked all the Malaysians again. And of course, she was going to appeal. All of them were. So in 1999, they still kept appealing because the pardons board was the only one that could offer them a pardon for this offense at that time. But they have refused every single one of their appeals. Which brings us to her final day, the day before her hanging. So we're now to join for her last meal on 1st of November 2001. 
The day before the executions, they were allowed an eight-hour-long visit by their family, so they were visited by their children, loved ones, and a senior prison's officer said that he has actually heard, like, a lot of crying, a lot of hugging, but a lot of positive enforcement by Mona in particular, who has advised their kids to grow up to be good people, and she also said, Yagadiri bike bike, which meant to take care of themselves well. Good old Pepsi, you guessed it, the last meal that they have had was KFC. What exactly wasn't specified, they just said like they had dinner from the KFC, so I just ordered one of my favorite combos, because they don't rule my life, okay? So on the 2nd of November, the three of them were... So on the 2nd of November, the three of them were brought to the gallows in Kajan prison, and they were hung. The creepiest part of the ordeal were Mona's last words, Aku takan mati, or I will never die. <laughs> I'm so scared. What did she mean by that? Nobody knows, nobody clarified it, because those were her last words. Why are you closing? Why are you shutting down on me? So they were all left to hang for about an hour until they were brought to autopsy, just again to do their checks, and, well, check that everything went according to plan, that the cause of death was asphyxiation. Mona and Afandi were buried that same day, so just later that day, at the cemetery in Kajang, and uh, Jiraimi was moved to his hometown, where he was buried also in, like, a Muslim cemetery. And Muslim's widow said that she can finally move on, leaving this part of her life in the past. Because of how the trial went, because of all of the Mona's shenanigans, the court actually abolished trial by jury in 1995. Mona's two mansions still stand, and they're the hotspots for adventure seekers, ghost hunters, whoever wants to go there every year and just see if they can spot the ghost of Mona or Afandi. But if there is truly one proof that her morbid legacy, as morbid as it is, still stands, that is the production and the postponement of the release of the horror movie Dukun. So this movie that everybody claimed was based on the true story of Mona Fendi's case uh, was actually produced in 2006. However, it was kept under wraps, it was kept secret. Two of the producers actually freaking out what impact this is gonna have on Mona's family, what implications it's gonna have on them. So the hype was apparently all worth it because they finally released it after the negotiations with her family in 2018, and it had the highest grossing night, and I think the highest grossing first four days of any movie made in Malaysia. And the way that they have gotten around it, well, I think partially was the hype, but then they said it's loosely based on a true story. So her legacy lives. A good guy did not win today. That's all what I can tell you. But now, let me, let me enjoy my freaking KFC. Move on with your freaking Friday, enjoy your weekend. What are you doing during the weekends? During quarantine, you're living your best life? Hmm. Put in the comments what other cases you want me to cover. If, you know, if there is like a surprise twist, like the one in this case, definitely put that one in. I'm all in for being surprised. Also, let me know in the comments, do you guys eat with me? <laughs> Once I bring on the food, do you bring on the snacks? Do you bring them on immediately before even pressing play on the last meals video? And if you are from Malaysia, tell me what is the common perception about this case? Do people still talk about it? What is, the, like, the first go-to once people mention the name on Fendi? So that's what I want to know. But until the next one, keep enjoying your next meal, as if it was your last. Why? Mmm, it's tomato sauce, eh? Tomato sauce from KFC. Order it. The bomb. Bye.